Hello, my name is William. I'm a Chargé de Mission at the Belgian War Heritage Institute. Today we are in the Royal Army Museum in Brussels. I started here in 1978. I was 16 years old and I'm one of the participants of the first days of the Belgian Tank Museum. Today we are in the First World War Hall and we are standing in front of our Mark IV Lotus Star, original British tank of that period. One peculiar thing about this tank is it's still in original colors, never touched. And you will see its original name painted on the side of this vehicle. Uh, it stood here since 19, the early 1920s when it came from England straight to the museum. Our Mark IV is quite complete. It's a male. It has a six-pounder gun, 57-millimeter uh, gun. Inside, nothing has been touched. Everything is there. The engine is complete. And if we would choose to do so, it might still be able to run. But since it's a one and only example we have, it has become a uh, rather a shrine, and it stays where it is for your pleasure. So we set up the interior so that you can look, but don't touch. Uh, everything is very original. Uh, the weaponry is original, the engines are original. The paint is totally original. Somebody wonders why it's still in that good shape. Well, it's because it stood here and nobody touched it. That makes it quite a unique feature. If you look at the hinges of the door. They point, both point upwards. So the Germans discovered that. So when they closed their armored doors, the Germans sneaked up on them and lifted the doors out of the hinges and threw grenades inside. And nobody ever noticed that. And the hinges later on were inversed so that you couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> so it's a little anecdote. 1914, the First World War, became a trench warfare. Now, to cross these trenches, you had several tries with gas, with heavy artillery, and nothing really works. So, in the end, the British came up with a tank, an armored vehicle to breach through the lines. Now, the trenches were a major problem because they had to be crossed. So that's why British ingenuity came up with this very special form of tanks. It was specially made so that it could go drive into the trench and work itself out again. Of course, at a very fabulous, fabulous speed of four kilometers an hour, which at those days was quite fast. Uh, but it enabled, in theory, the infantry to follow up with the tanks. That posed later on a problem because the Germans were not totally stupid. And that when they noticed that they could let pa the tanks pass by and then kill all the infantry behind it, or the tanks drove through artillery fire, whereas the infantry had to take cover. And so they lost each other on the battlefield. If you read records of that, you might notice that quite often, everybody lost each other on the battlefield. But sometimes luck helped and they were able to pierce through the German lines. And so the infantry could follow up. Now, you might have noticed uh, today, in these days we have now, that the Russian tanks have a beam, a wooden beam uh, hanging behind their engine deck. Uh, it's a very old feature. It actually was invented by the British once again. And you see the wooden beam on top of this tank with chains. So now trench warfare was a very muddy affair and sometimes tanks got ditched. So one of the equipment they carried is right an undetching, uh, undetching uh, beam. So it was thrown by the tracks in front of the tracks, and so the tracks could gain grip again and try to unditch themselves. The tank would drive over unditching beam, and with these change, it would pull up the beam back again to its, uh, its uh, locker. One maybe unknown feature is that they already had this idea of protecting the tank as maximum as they could. And so they decided to protect the fuel reserves because they noted, of course, that they could explode. Uh, the Germans rapidly developed a heavy anti-tank rifle that could pierce through the armor. And uh, logic said that the fuel tank should be at the back of the vehicle. And it was 
quite heavily armored already at those days. In these days, they recognized that that was a weak point, a weak spot of the tank. So it was kept behind the tank, behind the weaponry, and it was heavily armored. That's what you see here. And you can actually, in this museum, touch this tank, which is quite a unique feature. But it's still, as you can note, the original color. It, it faded a little bit, but fortunately for us, the hangar where we're in is quite somber, and that keeps the paint out of the sun. Now, in those days, people were not really used to mechanical things. Most of the time, they moved themselves still by horse. And you will read reports that the engine was very noisy. Now, indeed, the engine is right in the middle of the tank. It's a Ricardo engine, and the Ricardo engine later was used for powering ships and boats. I had the chance to be in one, in Bovington, when it drove around, and I noted that the engine was very silent, actually. But then you have to put yourself in the time of the First World War, where, as I mentioned, people were not used to engines, and for them, indeed, it was quite noisy. Um, the fumes, of course, were a problem, not really from the engine, but most of the time of the gunnery they used. They had two cannons, they had machine guns, and these produced a lot of noise and smoke, and that was not so easy for the boats. But I know that when I drove it. Yeah. How, very, did they, how, did they, and, and how did they mitigate the problem with the fumes of the guns? Mm -hmm. They didn't. Oh. The Wait. only thing you could do was open it up. Right. Which, in battle, you don't do. This. Right. <laughs> Now, another little gem in our museum in Brussels is this weird and strange-looking vehicle. It's a T-13. Now, this one is the sole surviving T-13 of the Belgian army of May 1940. It is pretty much in its original colors. It has its original markings. And we were able, when it arrived here, uh, to make it run a little bit. But of course, since the only one surviving, uh, we refrain of doing that quite often. Now, the T-13 is a defensive anti-tank weapon system, as we should call it today. The Belgian army in 1940 had a defensive posture, and I was not allowed by law to do too much offensive uh, training. So, in the late 1930s, they did buy British Dragon uh, light carriers on tracks, but they didn't work quite well. So instead of throwing everything overboard, they decided to convert them to something new. And they decided to convert them to carry the Belgian 47 mm anti-tank cannon, which was quite good at that time. So this is a mobile anti-tank system. Now, so as I told earlier, this is a defensive vehicle. That is why the gun points backwards. So it is used as a guerrilla kind of anti-tank warfare vehicle. It stays put for as long as it can, covered in the woods, shoots a few rounds, blocks the German columns and then scoots away. It's a, no, it's a tactic which was later taken over by most armies and is quite still in use today, but of course with more, more and more modern systems. It's a shoot and scoot type of vehicle. So the markings are still original. And the little sign you see here depicts a little devil with an anti-tank round. Red, black and yellow, which are the colors of the Belgian flag. Now, the Belgian army had border troops which guarded the, board, the borders and raised the alarm when the Germans had uh, crossed the border. So several units also had these little anti-tank vehicles. They actually had three marks of this. This is a Mark I. And they had a special built barracks, like a firehouse, where they could sleep on top, the first floor, and when the alarm was raised, they could slide down uh, like a firehouse and then jump into their vehicles and drive out fast and take up positions. 
This one here, we identified it as being the one of the Limburgse Grenzwielrijders, which means force protection, border protection troops of the province of Limburg, which is one of the ten provinces of Belgium. One of our volunteers in the early 1980s visited the Army Museum in Vienna and was allowed to go into the reserves and the cellars of the museum and he stumbled on this vehicle. He noted also that it was very original and the battery was still connected. So we tried to get it to Belgium and the Austrians at that time asked us 3 million Belgian francs for it. Now, the old veterans heard of it and they started a press campaign and so very hurriedly the military attaché of Austria came to Belgium to ask what is all this about? And we came to an agreement that Austria would give it back to Belgium. But we had to fetch it. So one murky morning, a Belgian C-130 filled with paratroops flew to Bavaria, not to invade Austria of course, but to drop them and then flew on to Vienna. They landed very discreetly we loaded up the vehicle and the C-130 brought it back to Belgium. And that is the story of how we got the T-13 in Belgium. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is an amazing museum. Come down to the Royal Military Museum. It's right in the heart of Brussels and come see this vehicle as well as a few others. You're not going to find them anywhere else and they're preserved beautifully. The links for this museum and its social media are down below in the description. Give those a follow and plan your trip. Like this video if you dug it and subscribe to see some more and I will see you next time for some more spaces and places of the War Heritage Institute here in Belgium and some more armored adventures. See you next time!